And we're going to move over now to Bill Clegg. Uh, so Bill is an emeritus professor at Newcastle uh, University, uh, supporting and improving crystallography at the university. Um, he has over 3,700 structures in the CSD, um, including the 1.1 million structure that was added earlier this year. And importantly for today, Bill has played a huge part in training new scientists and has done this through organising and teaching on international courses, um, on crystallography and synchrotron radiation science, and is also the author of several textbooks that are used in education. So today, Bill will be sharing his experience of teaching crystallography to chemistry undergraduate students and postgraduates. So over to you, Bill. Thank you. Uh... Is that my screen correctly being shown? It is, yes. Good, fine, because it looks different from when other people were sharing it. <laughs> and listen, I'm not used to this uh, this platform. I use Zoom all the time. Good. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, and the title on this slide encapsulates essentially the areas I was asked to talk about today. I think you'll see there's some overlap there with Mike's talk earlier, and you will see some comparisons and you will see some contrasts with what he had to say. Um, I'm going to set the context and in doing so I think you'll see some relevance to what Jess has just said about um, public engagement. So the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado uh, had an object all sublime to make the punishment fit the crime. And I don't want to suggest that learning crystallography is a punishment for anything, but uh, we also have a saying of horses for courses, and perhaps today I'm talking about courses for horses or courses for people. And the basic message that I want to, to give really is that teaching crystallography and demonstrating crystallography to different people isn't a one size fits all, and that the content and style of what we use needs to be suited to two things. It needs to be suited to the target audience, which I think relates a bit to what Jess was saying, at least peripherally, and it needs to be targeted to the um, the am amount of time and resources we have available, which is where you're going to see a bit of contrast to what Mike said earlier. So uh, if you're talking to the general public and to schools, then you, you have a different approach and you've got to combine some entertainment and information together, uh, and it has to be at a level suitable for their current interest and what they might make of the knowledge once they've got it. So it's relevant to their context and relevant to their potential use. And that relevance is a point that also applies at all higher levels of teaching and training crystallography. And I'm concentrating now on teaching some particular relevant aspects of crystallography, not the whole subject, which is very broad, to undergraduates and postgraduates in chemistry, because that's my experience. But the principles here are going to apply if you're teaching crystallography to students of other disciplines such as physics or biology as well. So let's look at um, undergraduate students. Um, now when I moved to Newcastle the first time, which was in the 1970s straight from my PhD, I had a teaching and research post, uh, fixed term, and I helped to teach crystallography but it wasn't my responsibility. And the course that was being taught, I think, was probably fairly typical of a lot of institutions at the time. I would call it very old fashioned. Um, these are my personal views and you might disagree with them. But a great deal of it was on geometry uh, and measuring up photographs and so on. And then very little was said beyond that. And I think it left the students very much with a feeling that what they were learning about crystallography was unrelated to the rest of their chemistry and of no practical use and therefore not very interesting. Now when I moved away to Germany and then I came back to Newcastle and in the 1980s um, I took responsibility for teaching all the crystallography and a great deal of chemistry as well and I could introduce some different ways of doing it. And the basic point uh, was to, that occurred to me was that this really wasn't mainly about training future crystallographers but I was having to teach all chemistry students right across the board, whatever they were going to do. And so I wanted to teach them crystallography in the context of chemistry as a whole and answer questions like, well, what's it about? 
how does it compare with other things I know better, like spectroscopy, which are easier to teach and more familiar? What can it do and what can't it do? Why does it matter and why should I bother to know something about it? Uh, and then how can I understand what on earth its results mean? Because it's such a complicated subject. And I was able to introduce things so that we don't teach the whole thing at one go. So um, in first year, I had a responsibility to teach a module on inorganic and structural chemistry, just about 12 lectures. And uh, in that, I was able to introduce a couple of lectures at that level to, to give people the first, their first touch really with, with symmetry. And that was mainly molecular symmetry for, for chemists two lectures there and we went as far as them knowing what a point group was but not actually applying anything that waited till second year but within that i was able to introduce a very brief description description of how symmetry is different when you get to the solid state because you get translation symmetry so we got the concept of lattices we got the concept of unit cells we didn't derive them there wasn't time um, and it was just enough for them to be able to understand what was in the rest of their inorganic chemistry, including simple ionic solids such as sodium chloride and closed packing models. The main part of the crystallography teaching came in year two. I think it's being revised at the moment and we'll probably be moving into year three, but I'm not involved in this anymore. Um, and it was taught alongside other structural methods, mainly NMR and other spectroscopies in a module called structural chemistry which was tied together lectures and practical sessions and the focus here is on one particular part of crystallography of course and that single crystal x-ray diffraction for determining crystal structures and then later on i was able to introduce some more advanced topics uh, into the final year of, of mchem when we developed into four-year courses at the master's level so what's in this second year course um, well, at Newcastle, at least, uh, we had an integrated approach. We had 10, I had 10 lectures to give, only 10. Um, and uh, in parallel, we had some a practical session, which unlike the physical inorganic and organic practicals was not in the lab. It was what we call dry lab experiments uh, using pen and paper exercises and sessions on computer clusters. And then we had some revision tutorials before their exams. And it was about this time that I was actually invited by OUP to write a book on uh, crystallography. And it was quite a good opportunity for me to embed what I was doing in the new course into a textbook that was parallel and alongside that I could then recommend the students to buy and make a bit of money as well. Not much, I might say. Um, now, there were four sections in this, uh, in this course, in the lecture course, not all of equal size, uh, and we didn't go very deeply into anything because we didn't have enough time. So there's some fundamental basic theory and the concepts, none of it detailed, uh, and also recognising that for an awful lot of our students, at least, uh, it may not be true everywhere, they were terrified of maths, some of them. Uh, and so whenever maths came in, and you can't do crystallography without some maths, then I would make sure that it was explained in other ways and with uh, graphical illustrations, such as when you do Fourier transforms, it's really just about adding up waves. So we did some pictures of that. The second part is uh, once you've laid the theory basis, then talking about uh, the experimental methods, only two or three lectures, uh, three, I think, um, just the main steps in outline from starting from having to get uh, suitable crystals and going right through to having results, understanding them, interpreting them, publishing them and dropping them into a database. Uh, then to illustrate all that, I had a couple of lectures of, of giving them some real case studies, illustrating all the different points that had come up in the theory and the practice. And then just a, a lecture or two at the end with a few tidying up additional topics uh, just to expand beyond x-rays to neutrons beyond single crystal to powder but only very very briefly and a little bit about how it relates to biological macromolecular crystallography because there are important differences but it's a topic they will have heard about 
where did the CSD come into it? Well, it, it, it did actually play a significant part because um, we talked about crystallographic databases and especially the CSD in chemistry uh, in the description of the experiment because it ends up with you making your results public. It's a waste of time if you don't. Uh, and going into the database is part of that. But also the CSD providing useful information at various stages for comparison with structures or checking that a, a, a structure hasn't been investigated before and so on. Um, and then in the, in, in the second edition of, of the textbook that I wrote, which came along some years later, uh, I embedded all the CSD ref codes uh, for all the examples and case studies into the text. Um, and so the, the students were able to refer to those and in fact, as I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, they were able to, to obtain the full sets of data for them as well. On the practical side, we had a couple of the sessions, which, which were, a lot of them were on um, spectroscopic analysis or learning how to use ChemDraw and so on, uh, various aspects of structural chemistry, but we had a couple that were crystallographically related. We had one session very early on where they used mercury and that's a very useful program for students to be able to display and manipulate structures um, and be able to understand something about them. And, and, and some students really struggle with three dimensional perception of molecules. So we had them looking at all sorts of things there like chirality and confirmations and so on. And to make it really relevant to other things they were doing and to help to integrate chemistry as a subject to students who like to modularize things too much, we used examples that came out of their organic and inorganic practical labs. So they knew these compounds, they'd met them somewhere else. And then in another session, we actually had them doing some simple searches of the CSD. At that time, we were using Conquest. I think the course is currently being revised to use the web CSD instead. Um, but it's it's very useful for them to explore structural relationships and to look at the information that crystallography actually provides. What do you know as a result of having a crystal structure? And they could explore that. As I say, I was invited by OUP to write a textbook that came out uh, in, uh, 19, in 1988, the first edition. Um, I was asked to produce a, an update in 2015. Well, it was 2015 by the time it came out. These things take some time to write. And the advantages of that second edition were that they'd taken away the length limit so I could put a substantial expansion in, put some extra material in. Obviously, some updating of, of, of the techniques, but this isn't just research training text. So there wasn't a huge amount of updating to do. Um, the, the, the theory hasn't changed much, though so its application has to a large extent. I replaced all the case studies by some more recent examples, which I thought were a better set altogether. And then perhaps the most important things in some ways were that uh, we introduced, OUP's um, suggestion, introduced lots of questions, exercises, model answers, and online material related to the book, which included sets of files of all the data and results for the examples so that students could manipulate themselves if they uh, had access to suitable software. So that was undergraduates. Then when we turn to uh, postgraduates a little more briefly, um, there are three levels here I've thought of. Uh, the first is that certainly what I was doing at Newcastle was to offer a very short um, course, just uh, two or three hours, of um, for students who were doing mainly synthetic research projects but who would want to have some knowledge of crystallography as part of that. So a bit of a reminder of the topics from the undergraduate course which would have been new material for some students if they came from elsewhere. Um, some practical tips on how to grow suitable crystals so that we could actually get better material from them from their experiments. Um, how to understand and interpret results once they got them, because they were going to incorporate results from other people into their thesis. And it's a good idea if they understand what it means, especially before their viva, when they might get asked awkward questions about it. And also how to assess the reliability and uh, significance of work 
not only that they've been involved in, but what they read in, in published uh, journals. Then obviously um, uh, uh, we trained students much more deeply if they were doing crystallography based or uh, other projects that had a large element of, of um, crystallography in them. But the main thing I wanted to mention here was organised intensive courses at a national or international level. And I was uh, quite uh, privileged to be involved in the, the British Crystallographic Association intensive course for uh, crystal structure determination started in 1987 at Aston University and later transferring to Durham University. And I was involved every two years in those courses for 30 years. Decided I'd better give up and let somebody else have a go. Um, and uh, so that was 16 schools, and in those schools I actually taught nearly all the topics, all I think except direct methods effectively. Uh, now this course we did, I think has a different approach from some others that are done in other countries. Um, it was very largely lecture style presentations mixed with group tutorial sessions and very little practical work using computers, which takes a lot of time and involves teaching people how to use specific software and so on. And we felt in the time we had available, there were more better things to do and they could uh, do their practical work on computers in their own groups. We wanted to avoid too broad a coverage, um, so only looked at single crystal diffraction. There are other courses put on in, in Britain for powder diffraction and for macromolecular crystallography. Um, and some of the features that I think are quite important for this were that it was important for us that everything was properly integrated and consistent. So after the first school in which we tended to do what a lot of schools do, which is invite star well-known crystallographers to pop up, give a lecture and then go away. Uh, we found the problem with this is you didn't get proper coverage. There were big gaps, there were overlaps and there were contradictions in what they said and using different terminology. Um, so we decided very early on that we would concentrate on having a small team of teachers who would commit to being there all the time, work together on preparation um, work together to make sure they were being consistent in how they presented things and that therefore we covered everything and everything once and uh, did it in, a, in an appropriate way that didn't leave gaps. So it was rather different from um, courses where you would get people coming in for a day and then going away which I think still happens in a lot of courses. It was set up mainly for postgraduate students and postdoctoral um, workers, uh, though occasionally we've had uh, academic staff coming back for a bit of a refresher course because they have some contact with crystallography but don't directly teach it. We um, produced a, a book out of it, again at OUP's suggestion, firstly after the 1999 school, then again after the 2007 school. Unlike my uh, undergraduate textbooks, there was a big difference between these two because being a research training textbook, it's very much more dependent on details of current methods and equipment and facilities. So the two books are really quite different and I wouldn't be at all surprised if somebody's asking for a third edition by now, but I won't be involved in that. Um, and, and, and I note that um, the, uh, uh, the last school I did was in uh, 2017. Um, so there's been another school since in 2019 that I wasn't involved in and this year's school which starts very soon um, will be virtual for the first time. That's going to be quite a challenge and I have to say I'm rather glad that I'm not going to be involved in it but that's a rather personal view. So um, I'd just like to acknowledge various people I've um, interacted with and learned from uh, a, a lot of other people over my career um, obviously my university for giving me the opportunity to develop, to develop this material um, and for funding for OUP to give me a chance to write suitable books that have uh, been quite well received. I mentioned David Watkin in particular because he set up the original Aston School um, and for Judith who arranged its move to Durham 
um, and all the people who sponsored the uh, the intensive courses and for the CCDC because they've provided the CSD that's played a significant part in what we've been doing and for organizing this meeting. So thank you everybody for your attention today. Great, thank you Bill for a great talk. Um, it was really interesting to see some of the approaches you've taken in education in crystallography and I think it's fair to say we've probably got about 30 copies of the Durham School handouts at least in CCDC and they're well scribbled on and well looked at and so I think they're a great resource and I think a lot of us share memories of the Durham School as well and so it was not just a good chance to learn crystallography but also meet the community um, I think you've got a few questions coming in there. Yeah, I, I can't so see I've how got... to take my presentation away. Can you do it for me or? Um, yeah. So we so can get back to a, a screen where I can see people. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so I think there's a comment from Mike. Did you want to ask that in person, Mike? Yeah, sure. It's I think it's more personal if we speak in person. Very nice talk, Bill. I, I I took interest in your comment toward the end there that you tried a model where you had a slate of expert speakers and you just felt it didn't go very well. And I was intrigued by that because I found that to be true also in lots of different topics when you say, oh, we're going to do this class by having a bunch of guests come in and give lectures and it just never hits well. And I'm wondering, do you think there, there's a right, have you ever seen this done well? Can this be done well? Or is this just something that we should avoid doing? It depends what you're trying to achieve. I mean, if you're doing a conference on some topic, then that's what you do. But if you're doing a training school, you just have to recognize that the top researchers are not necessarily the best teachers. It's, 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 a, different, it's a different skill and you need different people to do it. And, and also, if you have uh, some, some really, um, you know, star people aren't going to be able to give up a week of their time. And if they're not prepared to give up a week of their time, it's not going to help the way we want to do it. Did your lecture notes get handed down? You said you didn't do the 2019 school, Bill. Are they using the same material um, in the recent school? I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen. I, pa I I did pass all my material on, and mm -hmm. I suspect that what will happen is what tends to happen with these things, that it'll be used once or twice, and then gradually metamorphosed oh. into something <laughs> else, or ditched and rewritten, depending on who's taking over to teaching different topics. I, when I when I took topics over, I I tended to do a complete rewrite usually. Has anyone else got any questions or um, comments for Bill, or any follow up from the discussion with Mike? So I guess I while people are thinking about their questions, I had a question. What I guess you've been working to inspire people into crystallography what inspired you to go into crystallography and how how did that come about um i think probably uh, one positive and one negative okay. <laughs> uh, way in one is um i mean i did natural sciences tripos at cambridge and you have to do several subjects you have to do four subjects in your first year and i obviously was going to do maths physics and chemistry because that's what my a levels were in and I didn't want to do any biology whatsoever because I dropped it at the age of 12 and I didn't understand it. Uh, and they offered a subject called crystalline state. So I actually was learning crystallography um, from the beginning of undergraduate. And in the second year, I did some crystallography as a minor along, my major, along with my major chemistry. That's just the way Cambridge did it. And I'm very glad I went through that system. So I got interested in the subject from studying quite a lot of it as an undergraduate and the other thing is i was absolutely hopeless at practical lab chemistry i would always <laughs> drop something at the wrong point or something so, uh, so i was definitely not going to be a synthetic chemist and by the way when my colleagues introduce themselves as synthetic chemists i say well i'm a real one 